Thank you for tuning in to RTM Nation Online, where we believe that you will receive the abundance of peace, prosperity, security, stability, health, healing, and truth. If you would like to learn more about the ministry, click the link below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Now let's get into the message. Amen. Well, you know, um, the title of the message today is Before the Mountain Moves. Before the Mountain Moves. You know, I know we, we, you know, sometimes some of us get caught up in acting, you know, a certain way and we, 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 we act like and we walk like there's nothing going on in our lives. And, but the truth, truth be told, either you have a mountain or you just, and you're aware of it or you got a mountain and you, you're blind to it. But if you're pursuing the things that God has called you to, everybody has a mountain. Everybody has something standing in between them and the thing that they're expecting. Everybody, all of us, no matter how long you've been saved, no matter how long you've been in this thing, you could be just beginning, but there is something standing in between you and the thing that you want to happen. And this morning, if you haven't realized it, I pray that you leave this place fully aware of, of that mountain, but even beyond that, the purpose for the message today is to remind us of what we need to do before the mountain moves. You know we serve a mountain moving God. Yes, yes. We, you know we, we serve a Lord that, that gave us clues as to what to do with that mountain, right? Yes. You know there is no mountain that isn't, isn't set, that can't be moved. And today we'll find out what we need to do before the mountain moves. In Mark chapter 11, I don't think I gave them this scripture, so they might not have it to pull up, but in Mark chapter 11, I'm going to read for you, for you starting at verse 22 from the Easy Reader version. It says, Jesus, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he says, Jesus answered, and he says, have faith in God. Some translations are some ways that it's translated, it actually says, have the God kind of faith. And it says, this is true. The truth is, you can say to this mountain, go mountain, fall into the sea. And if you have no doubts in your mind and believe that what you say will happen, then God will do it for you. Jesus says, the truth is, you can say to this mountain, mountain, go into the sea. And if you have no doubt when you say what you said, God will move for you. <laughs> Glory to God. That's good news. You know, we've been talking about discipleship. We've been talking about discipleship, and there's some things that I want to encourage you in. And I want you to know that every disciple gets a reward. There's a reward for every disciple. Every disciple is compensated. There is compensation for every disciple. Every disciple gets a return on their investment. Every disciple gets a return on their invested investment. Any of you got some expectation? You know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm not the only one who came in here with some expectation, right? But I'm not only expecting things to happen today, but there's some things that I'm expecting to happen this year. Before this year closed, I, anybody else expected yes. some things to happen yes. before this year yes. ends? And then even next year and five years from now, 10 years from now, there's some things that I'm expecting way into the future. I got some expectation. Amen. If expectation is a currency, I'm loaded. Amen. Anybody else expecting some things to happen? Yeah, yeah. If you're not expecting anything to happen, then we need to start right there and build your expectation up. I'm telling you, you should be expecting some things to happen. And I just want to pump some hope in with your expectation, okay? No disciple leaves without receiving a return. Amen? Amen. Amen. This came up in conversation with the disciples, and in Mark chapter 10, I'm going to read this to you. Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 17. There's quite a few f verses right here, but, you know, we got time. I'm going to start in verse 17. I'm going to read this from the Amplified. You can read it with me, or you can just listen to me, whichever you prefer. You ready? It says this. 
It's talking about Jesus. And it says, as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran, ran up and knelt before him and asked him, teacher, you are essentially and perfectly morally good. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That is, to partake of eternal salvation in the Messiah's kingdom. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me essentially and perfectly morally good? There is none good except God. You know the commandments. Don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't defraud, honor your, mo- your mother and your father. And, and the man replied to him, teacher, I have carefully guarded and observed all these things and cared not to, taken care to not violate them from my boyhood. And Jesus, looking upon him, loved him. And he said to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all you have to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and accompany me. Walk with me, walk the same road that I walk. And at this saying, the man's countenance fell and was gloomy, and he went away grieved and sorrowing. He went away sad, for he was holding great possessions. And verse 23 says, And Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, With what difficulty will those who possess wealth and keep on holding it enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were amazed and bewildered and perplexed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard is it for those who trust? who place their confidence, their sense of safety and riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into God's kingdom. And they were shocked and exceedingly astonished and said to him and and to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus glanced around at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. And Peter stared, started to say to him, behold, we have yielded up and abandoned everything once and for all and joined you as your disciples, siding with your party and accompanying you on this walk, walking the same road that you walk. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, there is no one who has given up and left house or brothers or sisters or mother, father or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who will not receive a hundred times as much now in this life houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come eternal life so jesus says that there is a reward for the disciple mark i want to pull out some verses here and we're going to walk through and unpack this text okay you ready so going back to mark um 10 verse 17 it says and he, when he was going forth in, into the way, let's talk about Jesus. When Jesus was going forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So this young man had a desire. He had an expectation. There was something that he wanted. And what I'm asking you, and what I want you to ask the person next to you, is what do you want? Just real simple. What is it that you want? What do you want? See, this young man pursued Jesus because there was something that he wanted. Well, what is it that you want? What do you want? Amen. First, let's identify what it is that you want. In verse 19, it says this. Thou knowest the commandments. Jesus responds to him and he says, you know the commandments. You know not to commit adultery. You know not to kill. You know not to steal, not to bear false, false witness, not to defraud a Um, another person, honor your father and your mother. Those are the commandments that you know. What Jesus was saying was, I know you know these commandments, right? I know you know these commandments. I know that these are the commandments that you know, right? In verse 19 and verse 20, he says, and a young man said, yeah, I've, I've observed all of those commandments that you've just listed. I've observed all of them since I was a little boy, right? I've done all I know to do. And I can relate to that, and I'm sure some of you can relate to that, too. Aren't there some situations happening in your life? Or maybe I'll just talk about myself. I know that in my own personal life, there's some situations that aren't all that comfortable. And the conclusion of the matter, as far as I'm concerned, is I've done all I know to do. As it relates to this problem, I've done all I know to do. And, I, and, and if you haven't come to that place, then you, need, you just need to keep on going. I mean, I mean, come on now. If you if there are things that you desire, if there are situations that you got going on in your life that are 
uncomfortable and you haven't even gotten to the place where you've done all that you know to do, then you just need to keep on going. I mean, let's, let's, let's be honest about it. I mean, how, how badly, how serious are you about really getting change in that area if you haven't come to the place where you yourself haven't done all that you know to do? Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right. This young man says, you know what, I've done all that I know to do. I'm in pursuit of eternal life, and I've done all that I know to do. I fulfilled all the commandments that I know to fulfill, and I, here I am, I'm presenting myself to you, seeking eternal life. I've done all that I know to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I want to declare to you, I want to tell you that there's a place that you should get to, even maybe even before you, before you really, you know, you know, I've told you before that when I was about 13 years old, I had asthma. As a family, we had done all that we know to do. We knew to go to the doctor. We knew to get treatments. I had an inhaler. I had a pump. I had the machine that you used to have to hook up in case of emergencies. I had all of that. I knew that there are days when, you know, I was playing outside and maybe was playing a little hard and had to come in and, 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 and lie across my mama's lap and have her pat my back because the wheezing was that severe. We were doing all that we knew to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you haven't come to the place where you're doing all that you need to do, then you, you might not be that serious about having this situation change yet. <laughs> you know? Then we got to the place where in doing all that we know to do, now Jesus, God, we need some help here. Because as far as this problem relates to us, we've done all that we know to do. Now what can you do? This is a place that this young man has found himself. And verse 21 says, Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing you lack. I want you to understand that, you know, God is never picking on you. If you spend enough time with God and you get intimate in your relationship with him and he starts to identify things in you that need to change, it's not because he's picking on you. It's not because he's not trying to be, uh, he's not criticizing you. You know, it says Jesus looked upon him in love and showed him what was missing. Mm -hmm. There's something that you desire in order for you to receive it. Let me show you what's missing. It was out of love, and God still operates in that same love concerning us. There's something that you desire. I know there's things that you want, but let me show you what you're missing in order to gain the things that your heart really desires, in order to gain, I like Psalms 37 in the Amplified, it says, in order to obtain the secret petitions of your heart, let me show you what's missing. That's what a loving God would do. That's what a loving father would do, yeah. right? Yeah. Let me show you what is missing. So he says he loved him, and he shows him, and he tells him, he says, one thing you lack, go thy way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come, take up your cross and follow me. See, for years we've looked at this and we've paid a lot of attention to what Jesus told him to leave. And we concluded that Jesus told him to sell all of his stuff. And we kind of stopped right there like that was the point. That that is not the point. The point that Jesus is making is not go sell your stuff. The point that Jesus is making is never what sacrifice can you make to gain what I got for you. That's never the point. The point is never how much can you do in order to get me to do what I can do? How much can you sacrifice in order to make yourself fit for what I got for you? That's not the point that Jesus is making to this young man. What Jesus is saying is there's some things that are hindering you from being able to. This is the point. The point is you need to follow me. What Jesus was trying to get this young man to do was follow me. But in order for you to fully follow me, there's some things that are holding you back. I pray that everybody in here identify the things that are holding you back from following Jesus with everything that you got. What's holding you back? What's holding you back? What what thing have you put in front of you and Jesus? By your own choosing. Yeah, you desire to have a fulfilled life, but there's some things that you have, that you're holding to, that's holding you back. So so the point that Jesus was trying to get this young man to was, was, listen, the point is follow me. In order for you to gain what you're seeking, 
All you have to do is follow me. But understand that the things that have possession of you, those things are holding you back from following me. Go get rid of those things. Get rid of the things that hinder you. Get rid of the things that are holding you back. Get rid of the things that make you hesitate. That's what Jesus was saying. That's the point. That's the point. That's the same point that he's saying to us. Sometimes the life that you have now stops you from receiving the life that you want. Sometimes we hold so to the things that we have now. We hold so to the routines that we have now, and we're comfortable where we are now, and the comfort of today is what's hindering us from receiving what well, even the thing that we desire to have. The life that we're living today stops us from living the life that we want to live. That's the iron, irony in it. It's the life that we're living today. The things that you do every day, the things that you choose today. You choose your routine. You choose your habits. You choose it. And the thing that you're choosing every day is stopping you from living the life that you really want. That's the hard truth, but it's the truth. In, in verse 28, Peter speaks up. I love Peter. Peter was one of them friends. You know, you know, everybody got that friend that just say whatever come to their mind. And you have to pull a friend to the side and be like, man, that was not a good thing to say. You know, it's always after the fact with Peter. You know, Peter always got it. Peter was the one that had to come back and apologize. Listen, I know what I said, but I didn't mean it like that. No, you said it, Peter. You said it already. Peter was a passionate person. Any passionate people in here? Yeah. Well, that's why we like Peter, because we never have to guess at what he's thinking. We like people like that. We like people who we know where you stand. We like people like that. We do. Amen. Amen. Verse 28 says, then Peter began to say unto him, he's talking to Jesus. He says, lo, or recognize that we have left all. In, in, in response to what you just said, Jesus, let it be known that we left everything. We've left all and followed you. I like to read this from Matthew 19. It's the same account, just in a different place, Matthew's account of it. In Matthew 19, verse 27, Peter says, We left everything we had and followed, I'm sorry, it says, Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. Matthew 19, um, verse 27, from the easy reader version, it says, Peter said to him, We left everything we had and followed you, so what will we do? have. Based on what you just said, based on your own words, Jesus, you said that no person that leaves all of that stuff, that person will receive a hundred times everything they, they left. So let it be known that we left everything. So what, what you got for us? Now, I want to point something out to you. I want to point something out to you. That like many passionate people, Peter is asking about the compensation after he already made the investment. Right. So, see, for, for wise investors, let me tell you, wise in, some economics one-on-one, the wise investor always considers the return before they make the investment. The wise investor always considers whether or not the risk is worth the investment. That's what the wise investor does. The passionate investor, however, always puts the money down, walks away, and then considers, dang, what kind of return am I going to get for this? That's what the passionate investor does. The passionate investor makes the investment. See, you can relate to this. Have you ever jumped into something with both feet? Come on now. There's some, there's some relationships you jumped in with both feet. And then you got down the road and you was like, oh, my good, what did I just do? I know, I know, I know you, I know, I know most of y'all in here, y'all servants and y'all like to serve. I know there's some opportunities other people brought to you. And when they ask you, you know, they sold you, they, we, I just need some help. And you, you being the loving person that you are, you agreed to help them out. And then once you were in it with both feet, you was like, what did I get myself into? You, you, you presented this like this was just a five-minute situation. Now I'm spending my whole day helping you with your issue, and I got work left on my desk. You know, we jump into some situations with both feet without considering, what's the return on this investment? What's the return on this 
investment. But unlike Peter, many people never start because they estimate the perceived return. They estimate the perceived investment to be greater than the perceived return. So they never make the investment. Many people never get in. They never, they never leave the poolside. They still standing, holding on to the wall because they perceive that what I'm going to have to invest is greater than what I see could be a return. There are people who join churches and people who even come to Christ and they sit in church every Sunday, but they never make the necessary investment because they just can't see fully how the investment is going to yield the return that them people say that I'm going to get from this. So they never make the investment. No, they, they partially invest. They make a partial investment because they never see that the return can be greater than what's invested. But Jesus reassures us that there's no person that invests anything into the kingdom, into following me, that doesn't receive a hundred times what they've invested. And I want to encourage you with the same words. I want to encourage you to move away from the wall. Go ahead and get in the deep. God wants all of you. Jesus wants all of you. Jesus doesn't want a partial investment. There's no way that you can receive everything that he has for you if you just invest partially. Make the full investment. Make the full investment. See, the rich young ruler walked away from what was possible because he placed greater value on what he had. And so many people do the same thing. So many of us in different areas, we do the same thing. We value what we have greater than what can be produced. So we never make the investment. They think the risk of losing what they have isn't worth the return that God has for them. Let us not be like those people. Amen. Understand that there is a reward for the disciple. Jesus says, everyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, fathers, mother, children, or farms to follow me will get much more. Say much more. Who believe in for the much more? I like how he put that. I like how he said it. I like his words. It's just much more. You're going to receive much more. You get involved with me, you follow me, you're going to receive much more. And understand this. Understand this. He lists mothers, brothers, sisters, and, and fathers, and, and lands, and farms. He lists those things, but understand what those things represent. Those things represent your economy. Those things represent the way that you meet your own needs. Those things represent the way that you provide for yourself. Jesus says there is no person that leaves their own, their self-created economy to follow me that won't receive more from my economy. There's no person that won't leave, that, that doesn't, there's no person who leaves the way that they've made provision for themselves who won't receive more for, from the way that I plan to provide for them. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Okay? Glory to God. So, in the case of the disciples' reward, the conditions for the return are not based on what you invest. Let me say that again. In the case of the disciples' reward, the conditions for the return are not based on what you invest. Because understand this, understand this. Leo may have more houses to, to walk away from than me. So does that mean that his reward is going to be greater than mine? Somebody else, they, their, their economy, the economy that, that provides for them may be larger than the next person's economy. Does that mean that they got different rewards coming? Because you left and walked away from whatever investments you had or whatever life you made for yourself, does that mean that your return is going to be greater than the person that walked away from less? The investment in God's economy, the investment is not, it's not based on what you yourself have invested. The investment was not the point. The point that Jesus made to the rich young ruler, it had nothing to do with what he had. 
Jesus didn't take an inventory of what he had and said that you're going to get a return because of what you got. Because understand this, there are people who sacrifice stuff and give away stuff all the time, but that doesn't mean they enter into God's kingdom. There are people who think that people, for whatever reason, giving away stuff all the time. Jesus isn't saying that because you gave it away, you're going to get what I got for you. The point is, you follow me. The point is following me because you follow me. See, and that's the place where all of us are equal in that we've just all decided to follow him. That's why God, I say Jesus is the great equalizer because it doesn't matter what income level you come in at. As long as you're following him, all of us going to get the same reward. It doesn't matter how long you've been in it. You could have came at the top of the hour or at the bottom of the day. Everybody do the same reward. Why? Because he's the great equalizer. It's not about what you invest. It's about who you're following. (laughs) Go ahead and ask the person next to you, who you with? (laughs) Glory to God. I'm going to read that again to you. The conditions for the return are not based on what you left. The conditions for the return are based on who you follow. God's not looking for sacrifice. He's looking for obedience. God's not looking for sacrifice. He's looking for obedience. So again, the title of today's message is Before the Mountain Moves. Everybody want the mountain to move. Let's talk about what needs to happen before the mountain moves. Before the mountain moves. Can you get into that? that, that is, does that do something to you? I mean, when I came into my, my, my mind, I was like, ooh, that's a good one. Before the mountain moves. If you can't get excited about that, maybe you haven't identified your mountain yet. I need to know what happens before this mountain moves. I know that what I want is on the other side of this mountain. I need to know how we get this mountain out of the way. What needs to happen before this mountain moves? There's some things that God said that I have a right to, and all I need to know right now is what needs to happen before this mountain moves. You you need to identify what your mountain is. You know, the mountain represents the obstacle standing in between you and your reward. The mountain moving represents the miracle you need to happen to get your reward. Understand the thing that you are believing God for, if it's truly Something from God, only God can do it. Mm -hmm. See, I think that's where we get stuff mixed up. There's some stuff that you can get on your own. There's some things that you can do for yourself, and you can get those things on your own. But there are things that God has for you that only God can do. Mm -hmm. If you don't have some stuff in your expectation package that only God can do for you, I encourage you to, you need to stretch out at your expectations. Yes. You need every believer. That was, that's what makes us believers. Every, believers need, every believer needs to have some things that they're expecting that only God can do. Yes. Only God can do. There's some things that I figured out how to do in my own strength. There's some things that I can do in my own might. But then there's some things that only God can do. If this thing's going to happen, it's going to be because God did yes. this. Yes. Yes. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's what makes us believers. That's what makes it so that we walk by faith and not by sight. Because the thing that I'm expecting, I can't do this in my own strength. I can't figure out how to do this. There are some things you sit down and, you know, some of you, you know, in your finances, all you got to do is sit down and, and, and get financially literate and you can figure out how to untangle that knot. But then there's some things that you should be believing believing God for financially that only God can do this. So maybe the mountain that you need moved is a mountain of debt. You you ain't making enough to clear this much debt in your lifetime. The only way this mountain's going to be moved is if God does it. Maybe your mountain is a relational mountain and you got some broken relationships that need repairing and you, you r- tried to wrap your mind around how to make this thing right and you've done all that you know to do and at the end of the day, the only way this mountain is going to be moved is if God moves it. Maybe your mountain is a healing mountain. You got a situation going on in your body and the doctors have told you all that you need to do and you doing everything that you doing all that you know to do. And it hasn't brought peace. It hasn't brought healing. And now you're at the place where the way the only way this mountain is going to be moved is if God moves it. 
So what do I need to do before this mountain moves? Glory to God. Or maybe you have a goal. Maybe you have a God-sized goal. Or Roberts taught us not to expect, don't expect nothing small. We ain't believing right. for nothing small. Everything you believe God for needs to be big. So maybe you've just got some big God-sized goals. And the only way I'm going to get to this goal being accomplished is if God moves this mountain. Yes. Amen. What needs to happen before this mountain moves? And even my little kids, my middle schoolers and elementary schoolers, y'all, y'all, you know, some of y'all never made straight A's, but you got straight A's in your future. And the way that you're going to get that mountain to move is if you let God do it. God's got a way to get you the grades that you need to get. Glory to God. We're going to get some mountains moved in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're going to be known as a mountain moving people. If you got a mountain sized problem, call them folks over there at RTM. They move mountains. Glory to God. Maybe we get us a big moving truck and just put that on the side. We, everybody else moving furniture. We move mountains. We move a mountain. You need a mountain move? We figured out the recipe to have the mountain moved. Amen. Glory to God. So what's the mountain standing in between you and your reward? Sometimes the mountain isn't a what, sometimes it's a who. (laughs) Anybody got a who mountain? Don't raise your hand. They may be sitting next to you. (laughs) You know, sometimes, you know, you know, we think it's stuff in our mind. We think in our mind, you know, I could get this promotion if only this person retire. I can't wait. You know, you got their retirement date on your calendar. Five more years, they retire and I can get my promotion. You know, sometimes there's a who standing in the way of what we believe. If God just changed their heart, you done tried to get them every message that you hear you think can help them. You sent it to them and that not one has done the job yet. And you like this person, if this person changes, then I can have what I desire. Sometimes your mountain is a who. But either way it goes, whatever the mountain, whether it be a what or a who, we're going to find out how to get that mountain moved today. Amen. (laughs) Glory to God. There's something that has to happen before the mountain moves. Go to Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35. There's a few things that we did today um, that we inserted into the service um, that may set our ending time back a little further, but y'all all right? Amen. You know, when we started the uh, praise and worship set, the uh, projector wasn't working. And then um, the anointed man back there and on the equipment got it working right. So I said, let's start from the beginning. We ain't going to keep going. Let's start over. We starting fresh right now. So we're about 15 minutes delayed or so, but that's all right. Amen. I believe this word will make it worth it. Amen. 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 Isaiah 35. Let's look at Isaiah 35. I'm going to read um, Isaiah 35, verses 3 through 6 from the Easy Reader version, okay? It says this, Make the weak arms strong again. Strengthen the weak knees. People are afraid and confused. Say to them, be strong. Don't be afraid. Look. Your God will come and punish your enemies. He will come and give you your reward. He will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened so that they can see, and the ears of the deaf will be opened so that they can hear. Crippled people will dance like deer, and those who cannot speak now will use their voices to sing happy songs. This will happen when springs of water begin to flow in the dry desert. That sounds really good, right? But I want to point something out to you. Now, let's look, look at the list of things that are good. Look at the list, look at, look at the list that's, 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 that's here. He says, so make the weak arms strong, strengthen the weak knees. He says, people are confra- afraid and confused. I want you to give them some words to encourage them. God will reward them. God will save them. 
The blind eyes will be open for the person that can't see. He will see the person that can't hear. He will hear the cripple will dance like deer. And those who cannot speak now will use their voices to sing happy songs. And then watch what he says at the end. I know it sounds very poetic, but I want you to not miss what he hinges all of these good things on. He says all these good things will happen when springs of water begin to flow in the dry desert. Anybody got some good things they're expecting, but the good things is hinged on something that's impossible. Anybody in here can relate to that? Yes, there, there's some good things that you're expecting to happen, but the good thing you're expecting is hinged upon something that seems impossible, like this will never happen. <laughs> Glory to God. But here it is, this, this prophet is prophesying that there's some good things that are going to happen even though those good things are hinged upon something that's impossible, something that they say will never happen. Have you ever had your hopes hinged on an impossibility? The scripture says, God will bring your reward. Blind eyes will be open. Deaf ears will hear. The cripple will dance like deer. Those who can't speak will Seeing, I want to point something out right there, too. I want you to notice how God is stretching our expectation. See, sometimes in order for you to get what God has for you, what you're expecting is too small. He wants you to stretch it. Your expectation hasn't reached God's size yet. The thing that you want, you can figure it out. If you really became diligent about figuring that out, you could figure that out on your own. I want to tell you a truth. And the truth is that there are some things that you're believing God to do and God is saying to you, no, you can do that. That's right. you, the truth is you haven't been diligent enough to do. But if you, if you put some diligence on that, you can figure that out on your own. Stretch your expectation. Really invite me to do something that only I can do. Yeah. 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 I want you to notice how he's stretching our expectations right here. Listen to what he says. Look at what he says. The scripture says, God will bring your reward. Blind eyes will be open. Deaf ears will hear. The cripple will dance like deer. Those who can't speak will sing. God wants to stretch your expectations. At times when you're at your lowest point, God will stretch your vision. At times when it seems like you're at your lowest, you're without hope, you're at the end of yourself, that's when God comes in and stretches your vision. (laughs) It's at the time when you think you've exhausted all your resources, though God will give you something that's way beyond where you are. You know what I mean? That's just like God. You know, to come in in my situation, here I am, I'm praying that you just pay this bill and you telling me that I'm going to run a million dollar company. It's like, God, can we get on the same page, please? <laughs> but God is like, no, I need you to get on my page. If you want my involvement, I need you to get on my page. Amen, you can figure that bill out, truth be told. You can figure that out. You can figure that out. Let me get you on my page. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Look at what he says. Look at what he says. See, sometimes we look at something and we know right now we're looking at the next step, but God has a way to accelerate, uh, to accelerate your progress. We're just looking at what we need to do next. But when we get in the flow of God, God, God accelerates things. God th- makes things happen a lot quicker than what we could have ever planned. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? So God will cause you to skip steps. All we worried about is taking the next step and God is skipping steps. Because God is a multiplier. God is an accelerator. Notice what it says in this scripture. See, the cripple don't walk, which would be the next step. The next step will be for the crippled person to walk. But he says the crippled person will dance like a deer. God's skipping steps. Look what the scripture says. It says that the speechless just don't talk. See, the next step will be the speechless person to talk. But he says, no, we're skipping that step. The speech is going to sing. God wants you to skip steps. (laughs) There's stuff that you can figure out on your own, but God wants to do things in your life that only he can do. It's time to skip some steps. Tell the person next to you, skip a step. I'm skipping a step. I'm skipping a step. God's going to accelerate my progress. I'm skipping steps. It's time to skip some steps. It's time to skip some steps. See, when I skip steps, only God can get credit for that. When I just take the next step, I can say I did it. But when I skip steps, only God can do that, you know. 
Glory to God. What happens before the mountain moves? All these good things are hinged upon the impossible taking place. All these good things will happen when God does what only God can do. The scripture says your God will bring your reward. Blind eyes will be opened. Deaf ears will hear. The cripple will dance. Those who can't speak will sing. Those who can't pay their bills will be in abundance. Broken families will be model families. The depressed will have joy. The lost will give directions to others. Whatever you need done, it will happen after God does what only he can do. Glory to God. So what's really standing in between me and receiving the thing that I want? What's really standing in between me and the thing that I want? I'm I'm, I'm here to tell you that you got to give room for God to do what only God can do. That's, that's, that's really what, what he's waiting on. Yeah. You, you, t- you got to give God room to do what only he can do. Because the truth of the matter is that God isn't one for sharing the spotlight. Just, just in case you didn't know. I know God, God is. He's a good God. He's a loving father. But God is not the one to share the stage. Mm-hmm. When God does things, he wanted to be known that, I did that. Can't take no credit for that. I did that. I did that. Glory to God. In Luke chapter 5, Luke 5 from the Amplified, starting at verse number 1. It says, now it occurred that while the people pressed upon Jesus to hear the message of God, he was standing by the lake of Genezareth or the Sea of Galilee, And he saw two boats drawn up by the lake, but the fishermen had gone down from them and were washing their nets. And getting into one of the boats, the one that belonged to Peter, he requested of Peter to draw him away a little from the shore. Then Jesus sat down and continued to teach the crowd of people from the boat. So Peter sold his boat. Peter made his boat available for ministry. When Jesus had stopped speaking, he said to Simon Peter, put out into the deep water and lower your nets for a haul, a load. And Simon Peter answered, it's Peter, master, we toiled all night exhaustingly and caught nothing in our nets. I just want you to know that. Jesus, I just want you to know. I'm going to do what you told me to do, but I want you to know that me and a boat full of professional fishermen (laughs) spent the whole night fishing in this water, and we came up empty-handed. I just want you to know that the fish ain't biting today, Jesus. I just want you to know that. But I'm going to do what you told me to do. On the grounds of your word, I will lower the nets again. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish. Fish. They call it, a, I like to call it a boat sinking load of fish. As their nets were at the point of breaking, they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and take hold with them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Understand this Peter and his crew followed all the routine procedures of fishermen. They were professionals. They followed every step. They prepared their nets. They prepared their boats. They made provision. They went out at the best time to catch some fish. See, on that lake, on the the Galilee, the best time to go fishing was at night. Why? Because in the daytime, the fish see the nets and they ain't jumping in it. You got to do sneak attack on these fish. Peter says we did all that we knew to do. We've exhausted all that we knew to do. They were out for the maximum amount of time that made sense for a fisherman to be out catching fish. Can anybody relate to that? You've done all that you know to do. You've crossed your T's, you've dotted your I's, and you're still waiting on manifestation. Glory to God.
But yet, Peter says, at your word, on the grounds of your word, I'll go out again, just because you say so, right? And they caught a boat sinking load of fish. I'm so glad that God wasn't responding to Peter's obedience. Thank God he's not waiting on your obedience. God's not waiting on your obedience. The thing that you're believing him for isn't hinged upon your obedience. Them fish didn't get in the nets because Peter went out. Pete had already went out. The fish went in the net because Jesus said so. And I'm so glad that even today, God's not waiting on our obedience. He's not waiting on our obedience. With God, you get favor not because of who you are, but because of who you're with. Yeah, that's true. Amen. 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 I'll tell a quick story. Um, as a student at um, ORU, we were in Oklahoma. We were in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We took a trip. A group of students took a trip to Regent University. Regent University was founded by uh, Pat Robertson, Pat Robertson of the 700 Club. It's in Virginia Beach. So we took a trip to Virginia Beach and um, just to tour the campus and tour their graduate program. And one of the evenings, you know, we didn't have nothing, there was nothing on the agenda, so a group of us decided to go out, right? So we go out to this place that had an age restriction. You had to be a certain age in order to get in. Now, you know, here we are, some boys, we coming from Tulsa, we're in Virginia Beach, not really being familiar with the area. This is a place that we end up, not knowing that there's age restriction. I happen to be the youngest person in the group. The guys that I was with were, you know, uh, maybe 22, 21. They were old enough to get in. Not only am I the youngest, youngest in the group, but I happen to be at the end of the line. So they're proceeding in. We're walking in, not knowing that there's an age restriction. You know, we get up there. They don't think about young Le, Lamar in the back <laughs> of the line because they show their IDs and they get inside. Now they're inside waiting on me. I get to the security guard. He asks for my ID. I whip my ID out, show it to him, and he says, sorry, you're not old enough to get in. Well, what am I going to do now? So I stand, you know, the guys I'm with, they're looking back at me like, what's up, man? I say, I ain't old enough to get in here. One of the guys that I happened to be with was this, I mean, when you talk about iconic New Yorker, not, not, not the Bronx, not Brooklyn. He's, he's upstate New York. Any upstate New York people in here? Upstate New York. He's from Rochester. Rochester. You know, they have a certain sophistication about them. they just as savvy as anybody else from New York, but they, you know. So he comes out, and he talks to the security guard. I step away because I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to just be out here waiting on them. After y'all have y'all fun, then I'll meet you outside or whatever. But he's talking to, to the security guard. I'm a distance away. I can't hear what he's saying. I, ain't, I don't hear what he's saying. I ain't see him slipping no money. All I know, a few minutes of conversation, and then they waving me in. So I got in, but it wasn't because of nothing that I did. But it was because of who I was with. See, there's some things, there's some favors that we get. Now, as a matter of fact, that all the favors we get from God, it has nothing to do with us and who and what we did. But it has all to do with who we are with. Amen. Amen. There's a reward in alignment. There's a reward in being with our Savior. There's a reward in being about the same work as, their, as, as the Savior, I guarantee you Peter wouldn't have caught. Peter and his boys would have went home empty-handed if it were not for who they were with, if they weren't for, if they were not about his business. See, what happened was what was important to Jesus in that moment became important to Peter, and Peter put himself in position for God to do what only God can do. Yes. You need a boat, Jesus, you can use this boat. And I'm telling you the same thing applies to us, is when we align ourselves with what's important to God, then all of God's favor, all of God's ability, all the forces of God are made available for those who put themselves in alignment with what's important to him. You want to see the free favors of God profusely abound in your life? Be about your father's business. Yeah. 
Be about your father's business. Be about establishing his kingdom. Make that your purpose. Make his purpose your purpose, and all of the resources that he has reserved for his kingdom to come will flow through you because you've partnered yourself with him. I want to look at Isaiah 35 again in closing. What needs to happen before this mountain moves? I'm going to answer the question. Before the mountain moves, you need to move. There's some moving you need to do. There's some things that you need to do. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says that it shows us that grace makes salvation available, but it comes through faith. There are things that God has made available to you. Jesus has finished the work, and those things are available. You're going to get it by faith. And what James said way back when is still true today. Faith without works is dead. Before your mountain moves, you need to move. Before Peter could catch them fish, he had to take that boat back out. Before your mountain moves, you need to move. Let me point this out to you. Same scripture that we read earlier, Isaiah 35, starting at verse 3, it says, Make the weak arm strong again. That's your job. That's your job. You're a disciple. It's your job to make the weak arm strong. That's your job. Strengthen the weak knees. That's your job. That's what you need to do. That's the moving that you need to do. People are afraid and confused. You say to them, be strong. Don't be afraid. Look, your God will come and punish your enemies. He will come and give you your reward. He will save you. That's your job to encourage those who need to be encouraged. That's the part you play. That's your job. After you've done your job, Then the eyes of the blind will be open so that they can see. And the ears of the deaf will be open so that they can hear. Crippled people will dance like deer, and those who cannot speak now will use their voices to sing happy songs. This will happen when the springs of water begin to flow in the dry desert. You've got to do your job. You've got to be about your father's business. The resources of heaven are reserved for his purpose to be established in this earth. Jesus was in place on that lake. The fish were in place on that lake. Peter had to go out into the deep. Peter had to go out there and get out there and cast the nets. That was his part. Amen. Stand on your feet. You've got to do your part. God told me some years ago, I was dealing with some things financially. I had messed some stuff up, and I was about ready to blame it on God. And he says to me, he says, he said, man, I'm the best accountant. He says, my book, I'm never over budget, budget, I'm never under budget. I have exactly what I need to do what I need to do. What you messed up, you messed that up. But I want to point out that he's saying the same thing to us. There are things that you desire. Your fulfilled life, the life that you desire, the life that you dream of, the life that you want, the fulfillment that you're seeking, God's got it. He told you in Ephesians chapter 2.10, I've already prepared a good life for you. God's got it. It's reserved. But remember that God is the best accountant. What he's reserved is for his purpose. When we position ourselves in alignment with his purpose, everything that he's reserved is free to flow through us. Let's make sure that we're doing our part. Let's make sure we are doing 
our part. Amen. Amen. Give God some praise. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. We pray that today's message was a blessing to you. If you would like to help us further expand the vision, simply text the word Give RTM to the number 41444 or visit us online at www.revealingtruth.org. Now remember, Jesus loves you. <laughs>